go down. I think it's okay. Okay, so bienvenue à tous. So, anyway, everybody. So I'm going to first present the jury. So first, uh, people present here. Pascal Desboulins, Olga Alex Pouvoir, Pierre Glossaf, moi-même, Laurence Rousseau, professeur à Sorbonne Université. Now, uh, distant, Annie Pouquet. Thierry Passo. Bonjour. And, uh, Marco Belli. Bonjour. Hello. So we are going to listen to your presentation. We have about three minutes an hour, and then we will ask questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can. Shall I start? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, my today I would like to uh, present my results, results of my PhD thesis. Uh, about the about the nature of clearing structures from MHT to subion scales in the turbulent solar wind uh, observed by the Parker Solar Probe. Uh, so let me first introduce what what is the turbulence. Uh, so the evolution of the hydrodynamic flow uh, is described by the navier stokes equation. This is the incompressible case uh, of the navier stokes equation. And uh, uh, in this equation, uh, there are two main terms that uh, cause the turbulence. So this term is nonlinear term, and this term, uh, this term is vicious term. Uh, the ratio of these two terms, uh, if we may if we evaluate uh, the order of the magnitude at the uh, at the scale of injection. Then this gives us the Reynolds number. This number characterizes the flow. Um, if the flow, if the Reynolds number is much higher than one, much greater than one, then the flow becomes turbulent. So here on the right hand side, you can see uh, one experiment um, of the show, showing uh, how the initial laminar flow uh, after uh, passing through the grid with a characteristic scale n, then becomes turbulent. In this case, this experiment uh, is, so on the right hand side, this is turbulent fluctuations on the flow. Um, yeah. So if we measure the spectrum of these fluctuations that I showed before in the previous slide, uh, the experiment we observed uh, a power law spectrum uh, as it's shown here, uh, and the range of frequencies, the corresponding range of frequencies is called the inertial range. Uh, this is the range of scales between the injection scale N and the dissipation scale, scale uh, AT. So uh, scientists were wondering how to explain this power law spectrum. And uh, the idea is that uh, after the energy is injected at the scale, at the scale L, uh, then, by means of the nonlinear term, it is transferred from the large scale edges to smaller and smaller ones until uh, the edges become so small that the vis viscosity is uh, high. Then the, the, they are dissipated and the, their energy is transferred into the heat. Uh, and yeah, so uh, assuming that uh, these fluctuations are anisotropic. Uh, uh, and the energy cascade rate uh, is uh, equal at each scale. So there, are, there is no accumulation of energy at any particular scale in the inertial range. Uh, Kolmogorov uh, predicted the, the power law spectrum, the Kolmogorov flow, uh, that allows us to explain this, uh, this power law observed in observations. But our, our case is more about the plasma, not the hydrodynamics, the plasma of the solar wind. Uh, solar wind is a magnetized plasma that is uh, originating from the solar corona. 
uh, after the expansion of the of this plasma to the interplanetary space, uh, the solar wind is propagating and the feeling the feeling the volume. Uh, it is propagating along the open uh, magnetic field lines as I show here. So our research is about the fluctuations, about the turbulence in the solar wind. So in contrast with hydrodynamics, um, the magnetic field, the presence of magnetic field um, it is organizing the turbulent fluctuations in the solar wind. Um, you see uh, here, the MHT equations that describe the evolution of the plasma uh, at, at MHT scales. So here we have not only uh, not only velocity but also the magnetic field, and it is affecting the, the dynamics of the flow, and uh, especially introducing the anisotropy of fluctuations. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, you can see the simulation simulation of the turbulence development. Uh, this is a big simulation. Um, and the, the current density is shown in color here. Um, the magnetic field the line is organizing the populations around it. Uh, this is this is the, uh, the schematics of the Parker Slow probe. And the uh, spacecraft is crossing the plasma like this. And uh, it is measuring the magnetic field and other parameters of the plasma in the solar wind. So after measuring the, uh, the magnetic fluctuation, we can make a Fourier transform and uh, evaluate and uh, calculate the spectrum, the spectrum of magnetic fluctuations. And it is shown here. Um, the blue region, of, uh, this is, this is, this is um, the region of frequencies uh, corresponding to injection schemes. The red, the red region is the inertial range. Uh, the green is the transition scales where the MHT approximation uh, is not uh, wedded anymore, becomes not embedded. And uh, the yellow region uh, is uh, show, show, shows the regional frequencies corresponding to sub-ion scales, where ions, uh, ions are nearly static because uh, they are too inert to interact with the uh, electromagnetic populations. But electrons are still uh, behaving as a fluid. So what was known before is that um, the fluctuations of magnetic field, um, they have uh, different distributions depending on the scale uh, which we are considering. So on the left hand side, uh, this is the probability distribution function of the magnetic field increments. Uh, the increments are defined like this. So just uh, the difference between magnetic field in two different points, two different time points. Um, Important thing is that uh, time lag parameter tau um, at large scales, the distribution of increments is nearly Gaussian here, but um, at smaller time lags, you can see uh, the presence of non Gaussian tails here and here in the distribution. Uh, all these panels are for, uh, they correspond to MHG scales, they are large MHG scales, and these are small MHG scales. But yeah, we can ask ourselves a question: What, what is, what does it mean? This non-Gaussian tails, and uh, to illustrate this, uh, we can take a look on the simulation of results uh, presented on the right hand side. Uh, so this is the result of the simulation. Um, the color shows the current density. This is the corresponding distribution of the amplitude of the uh, current density in different points of this simulation box, and uh, uh, you can see that uh, the core of the distribution, where the currents are small, uh, this is forming kind of a background of uh, turbulent fluctuations, but the tails, the tails here, uh, they correspond to a small localized regions, uh, current sheets, um, uh, concentrations of the strong uh, current density. So we conclude that um, the presence of this non Gaussian phase associated with localized events. Uh, yeah. So this is, this is a, in another simulation. Um, 
showing uh, the detection of different types of coherent structures in, in three dimensions. So you can see a, car, a thin current sheet uh, over here, another current sheet over here, and uh, a vortex um, here and the emerging vortex here. Uh, the current shows the current density once again, as in the previous slide. Um, yeah, so um, now I would like to illustrate the definition of coherent structures. What is a coherent structure? Coherent structure is a high amplitude concentration uh, concentrated uh, event localized in space and stable in time so that uh, it maintains its coherency until it is interacting with another coherent structure uh, or it is uh, dissipated. So it is becoming so small that it is dissipated. Uh, so what, what are different types of coherent structures in the solar wind? Um, first, as we have seen before, uh, but this is the observational result. Uh, this, this is the, the example of current shape. The second example is the Alpen vortex, the Alpen vortices, but they are much less studied than current shapes because current shapes are easier to detect, both in observations and in simulations. There are other types of structures or coherent structures, such as magnetic poles that are characterized by the depression of the magnetic field. Uh, yeah, and there are also other types of uh, structures, but we are limiting ourselves with these main types. Um, so what is known about coherent structures in the solar wind? The first point is that most of the studies uh, have been done at uh, one astronomical unit. Um, most of the studies were focused on the analysis of current sheets. Uh, and, uh, but other types of uh, structures were also detected, especially at time scales. Uh, there was a nice work of uh, Irone, who analyzed different types of structures at time scales, such as vortices, shocks, solitons, not only current sheets. Uh, also, uh, there is an important work of uh, Leon, who showed the multi-scale uh, multi nature of the coherent structures, um, from MHD to ion scales. And, uh, and then there is another uh, interesting point of research is that uh, in structures, they can be of different size. And uh, apparently, um, uh, there are studies uh, investigating the embedding of small scale structures, sub scale structures, uh, uh, namely current sheets in this case, in the case of the Greco, the article of the Greco, and uh, also with a paper analyzing the uh, ion scale vortex embedded in the, in the current sheet paper of July. So now I would like to pass to, uh, to the formulation of, uh, of the questions that, that we are addressing in our study. First, um, what is the, um, what is the, um, what is the the features of the group of proven computations closer to the sun. Um, we also investigate if there is a connection between uh, structures at MHD and at sub ion scales, and what is this connection. Um, we, uh, we also estimate the relative occurrence rate of different types of structures. What is this? And um, um, we also develop uh, improve the understanding of the uh, Eichmann vortex model. So these are main questions that we are addressing in our study. So let us start with the model, uh, the Eichmann vortex model <coughs> produced by Ashvili Pakhatel. It is based on the reduced MHG equations. Uh, uh, so. Uh, a kind of simplification of the MHD equation. Um, in case if uh, in case if the locations are perpendicularly anisotropic, slowly varying, and uh, then in this case, uh, instead of uh, the vector equation, ve vector MHD equations, um, we obtain only two equations on the scalar on the scalar quantities uh, AZ, which is the actual uh, vector potential and uh, on the PC, which is a flux function. 
So this is this is uh, the reduced MHD equations. Um, yeah. So uh, we 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 are trying to yeah we are following the derivation of uh, here we are following the derivation of the Um So the idea is that uh, the vortex in general case it can be slightly inclined with respect to the background magnetic field. Uh, and uh, here we show this inclination. So black reference frame system uh, is oriented with respect to the background magnetic field, while uh, this new reference system, it is turned a little bit on the small angle phi. And um, we are uh, searching for a particular solution, which is, um, um, so we introduce a new variable, eta, um, uh, which is which includes, um, yeah, we are trying to find the solution which is propagating in a constant speed. Uh, so in order to do this, we introduce a new reference frame system which is moving with the vortex. Uh, so we search for a solution where the vector potential is the function of uh, of two of only two coordinates x and eta, where eta is including uh, is including time here in order to uh, model this um, motion motion of the vortex. So once again, here is the uh, reduced MHD equations. Uh, we um, so we apply this uh, MHD equations transform them into this turn inclined uh, reference frame system. So all the derivatives, derivatives here are transformed like this. And then we, uh, to simplify once again, the equations, we introduce A, Z, tilde, and C tilde, a new variables that um, allow us to get the simpler form of equations and solve them. So yeah, with respect to this a tilde, um, a, a z tilde and c tilde, the new version of the equation is shown here. This is still non linear equation. Um, yeah, but um, this, this, uh, let's take a look at, at the second equation, um, this one. So, in general, uh, if the Poisson bracket is equal to zero, it means that the first quantity is an arbitrary function of the second one, and it will be a solution of this equation. But, um, yeah, but we, uh, we are following here the derivation of the bit and uh, but we explain, no, but we, we, cho we, cho we, we choose only linear dependence of the, um, of the uh, flux function C uh, depending on AZ. Uh, because and uh, the, the new result here is that uh, in fact this uh, statement this statement is equivalent to the saying that the perpendicular fluctuation in velocity is proportional to the perpendicular fluctuation of magnetic field with a with a uh, coefficient c. Uh, yeah, and then in this case. Uh, Using, using this uh, linearization. The second equation is also simplified, and we get this. Uh, in case if uh, C is equal to plus or minus one, um, we obtain the arbitrary alpenic solution. So the solution where magnetic field and the uh, velocity in normalized units, uh, they are uh, directly correlated, related one to each other with the coefficient of one. Uh, and in other way, if, if it is not the case, uh, the solution, um, this, um, this multiplier must, must be equal to zero. And uh, this means that uh, number square of AZ is arbitrary function of AZ. Um, but this is, um, at this point, we introduce the second, we, um, explore, uh, we introduce the second linearization, uh, which is, uh, the fact that inside the cylinder, uh, we require that uh, the solution is force free. So, but outside, with, 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 um, 
not, not, with non zero current density shift, which is related to the vector potential here. But outside of the cylinder, we put the requirement that um, the current density must be equal to zero. So here, the, the, finally, after these two linearizations, um, this system becomes linear. Um, so once again, what are the, uh, yeah, yeah, two. Sorry. So we are looking for a continuous solution inside the cylinder and outside of the cylinder. First one, first equation here is about the inside and the, the second one is about the outside. And we require that um, require that magnetic field is continuous in the boundary inside from the inside to the outside, and that uh, there is no total current. I mean, the integral over over the plane of the vortex um, uh, integral of the current density is equal to zero. So no no total current density. Um, in this case, um, we obtain um, we consider the general solution uh, of these equations. And um, we conclude that, uh, in contrast to the result of uh, the where there was a particular solution where there is only a monopole vortex and the dipole vortex, we concluded that uh, quadrupole vortex can be also uh, superposed uh, uh, or, or with, 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 with this um, uh, monopole and uh, dipole solutions. So let me do the summary of this uh, development. So what are the what are, what are the alpine vortices? Alpine vortices are cylindrical uh, coherent structures. They may be they may be inclined with respect to the magnetic field on a small angle. Uh, in this case, they are propagating. And uh, what is new in our result here is that uh, we found that not only a monopole and dipole can be a solution, but also quadrupole and uh, other harmonics. We also discussed the condition to superpose different uh, vortices. So let me pass to the observational part of our uh, work. So we are using the purchase for probe data from the first encounter, um, where the purchase for probe mission uh, spacecraft was at a distance of 0.17 astronomical units. Uh, this, we are taking the five hour time interval, which is, sorry, uh, which is um, which is known to be highly perturbed. So the fluctuations are really high amplitude. And we uh, analyze the coherent structures. Yeah, in order to analyze the coherent structures, we apply the wave uh, the wavelet transform. Wavelet transform is, is based on the um, uh, convolution of the original uh, signal with the uh, mother function C here, which is uh, time shifted and uh, rescaled uh, at the scale tau. Uh, we, we are using the more wavelet mother function, which is shown here. This is a compl complex function. Yeah, the real and imaginary part of this mother function is shown on the right panel. And uh, we are using the quantity, which is called uh, the local intermittency measure introduced by uh, Farge uh, to analyze the coherent structures. This is equal to the amplitude of the wave that transform at time t in the period tau uh, with respect to the mean energy at, at the corresponding period tau. So in order to detect coherent structures, we need to compare the signal with the incoherent signal. Um, if the observed signal is shown here, um, we may do a Fourier transform and we obtain the amplitudes of the signal and the phases. Um, um, the amplitudes are shown here, they're following the spectrum and uh, the phases are shown in this panel. If um, yeah, the phases they look quite random. Not really. Uh, we don't have any. We, 
Yeah, this panel looks like a noise, but in fact, there is a certain degree of coherence in this signal. And if, but if we destroy this coherence by randomizing the phases and then uh, doing uh, an inverse transform with keeping the same Fourier amplitudes, but with randomized phases, uh, we obtain the random phase signal. And in contrast with the original signal, this has completely different statistical properties. So if the distribution of the original signal uh, has non-Gaussian tails, um, even in this case, after the randomization of phases, uh, the random phase signal does not have uh, any non-Gaussian tails. So it means that uh, these non-Gaussian tails uh, are really uh, related to the couple of phases in the signal, so related to coherent structures. So um, here, yeah, on the left-hand side, we show the magnetic field measurements in radial tension show normal coordinate reference frame. Uh, the interval of 30 minutes, sub-interval, our total interval that we are analyzing. And uh, in bottom, on the bottom, we show the scalagram of the local intermittency measure. Um, you see, um, yeah, and on, on the right, right panel here, this is the random phase signal uh, calculated as we discussed before, and I, as I have shown before. And the corresponding scalogram is shown here. And uh, you see that um, in contrast with the original signal where there are a lot of vertical lines in the scalogram, so a lot of coherent structures, the random phase signal, there is no vertical lines, so no coherent events. Um, yeah, and what is also interesting is that these vertical lines, they are present not only at the inertial range, which is shown uh, by red band, but they are continuing down to subion scales, which is shown here in the blue, in the blue transparent um, band. Uh, yeah, so in order to detect coherent structures, uh, we uh, we integrate the local intermittency measure uh, along uh, all the periods um, and we obtain the, the signal which is shown in green here. Uh, the black curve here is, is corresponding to the integrated local intermittency measure for the random phase signal and uh, the maximum value for the random phase signal is giving us a threshold to detect, to detect um, the coherent structures. So let me show you two examples of uh, coherent structures at multiple scales, at MHG scales and at small scales. Uh, this, is, this is an example of the current shift. You can see that the normal component of the magnetic field is changing side in the very center, but also the tangential component uh, is very sharp in the, in the center. Um, and uh, the, the, the panel, the panel uh, below is showing the bandpass filter data uh, at MHT scales. So, uh, yeah, and the strong discontinuity is here, is present in the center. But uh, the, uh, on the on the right hand side, the panel, this panel is showing us an example of an IFA vortex, um, and uh, it is even better observed after the filtration of the data when we uh, keep on the MHD fluctuations. Um, if we apply bandpass filtering and removing all the frequencies uh, below, uh, below one thirds and above 100 thirds, uh, this shape is very, is consistent with the crossing of the natural bodies. But now uh, we ask ourselves the question, what is, what is present uh, at smaller scales inside or nearby these MHG scale structures? And um, 
um, these, these panels are showing us um, the band pass filter signal at ion scales, um, which is uh, showing us the embedded vortex in the current shape. And the embedded vortex is MHD scale vortex. And also, it is showing us um, the sub ion scale structures uh, here and here. So, if we focus on the first example, uh, this is the current sheet at the image. Um, this is the current sheet. And this, inside this current sheet, there is an, an embedded vortex uh, shown here, and even a smaller uh, vortex inside. Um, the second example is showing us the embedding of one vortex into another. So in the previous slide, we were showing only one substructure in a large MHD scale structure. But here we would like to uh, investigate if there is only one structure as sub ion scales embedded in, in a larger one, or if there are new, more, much more numerous structures distributed, uh, distributed in, this, in, the, in the volume of the um, in the in, in, in solar in the solar wind okay, located in different points. So uh, this is this is the time interval showing us uh, another another event. And uh, inside the single the single MHD scale structure nearby, we can see a lot of a lot of uh, events. But this is these sub ion scale coherent structures are present not only nearby or inside the large scale MHD scale structure, but also there are isolated events like, for example, here. And uh, we confirm this, uh, this idea that we, that I tried to illustrate uh, in this scalogram on the left hand side. Um, we can confirm this, um, uh, calculating the number of structures at uh, scale by scale. So this is shown here. So um, number of structures is increasing uh, at some at, at sub ion scales. We observe much more structures than than at the MHD scales. But interestingly, the feeding factor of the structures is uh, decreasing a little bit in the inertial range, and then becomes constant. So uh, if we take uh, the whole statistics of for the detected events, uh, we found around 100 MHD scale structures with a feeding factor of around 12%, uh, about 2,000 structures at ion, at ion scales, and uh, about 10,000 structures um, at sub-ion scales. Um, yeah, and uh, now we would like to classify these structures if there are more current sheets among them or open vortices or magnetic poles. Uh, yeah. In order to do this, we apply minimum variance analysis to characterize automatically these structures because they are very large in number. So what is minimum variance analysis? Minimum variance analysis is based on the properties of the uh, magnetic field uh, operation matrix, which is defined here. Um, if we solve the problem, uh, the Asian value problem for this matrix, we obtain, we obtain uh, three Asian values and three corresponding Asian vectors. Um, these Asian vectors are showing the direction of the maximum, intermediate, and the uh, minimum variance directions. Um, and uh, yeah, the Asian values they show us the, the variance along 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 this uh, principal uh, direction. So here uh, we show uh, the the ellipsoid of variances is shown with uh, three principal um, with, with with three directions corresponding to uh, the Asian vectors of, of the magnetic field 
over the range matrix. So now for each for each structure, like MHT, ion, and sub ion scales, uh, we perform an, a minimum variance analysis and obtain uh, three Asian values uh, lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. And uh, for each structure, we put it on the plane of the minimum variance Asian value ratios. So each point here is corresponding to one. Yeah, so this is. Um, this is showing us the analysis of the MHT scale structures using raw data without any filtration. Uh, this is showing us the, uh, the MHT scale structures um, using the filtered magnetic field data at MHT scales, one plus filtered data. Uh, this, is, uh, this panel is corresponding to ion scale structures, and this is for sub ion scale structures. We can see that the distribution is nearly similar at MHT scales and uh, at sub at ion scales, but uh, very different at, at, at sub ion scales. So we ask ourselves, what does it mean? And uh, to respond to this question, we we try to analyze the model the models of structures of coherent structures. Um, so if we Cross an alpha and vortex model along the numerous along the trajectories shown in shown in, in, in the blue column here with equal probability. For each trajectory, we obtain a time series of the magnetic field along the trajectory. Uh, if we perform for this magnetic field, if we perform the minimum variance analysis, we get a point somewhere on the uh, on the uh, plane of the minimum variance results. And uh, what is interesting is that um, the, the geometrical properties of the structures, they are reflected in, um, in, in this minimum variance results. So uh, minimum variance results are uh, different for alpha and vortices, for current shapes, for the magnetic cores. Um, and it seems that the observations, uh, the distribution on the minimum variance um, plane that, that, I, that, have, that I have shown in the, pre in the previous slide uh, is a superposition. It's a combination of this, um, of this, uh, of, of the crossings of different types of structures such as I think works as current shifts. Yeah, now, uh, we would like to fit the distribution from observations with, uh, with a linear combination of the distribution obtained uh, after crossing the model structures with equal probability along the different trajectories. So this panel is showing us the observational results and these four panels are showing us the results of the, of the model crossing. And uh, um, we are minimizing the difference between the observed, observed um, distribution and the linear combination of these um, probabilities uh, of these distributions obtained from the crossings with the coefficients p, the function of the model, which is uh, showing us the probability to encounter different types of structure for each structure. Uh, so we also require that some of these probabilities must be below one, and each probability uh, is above zero. It's positive, it must be positive. So after minimization of this uh, function, uh, we obtain the, the values of the p, uh, and this is done for M for the statistics of MHG scale structures. But we also repeat the same procedure for ion scale structures and for sub ion scale structures in order to obtain this P as a function of the model. So finally, what we found is that um, at MHG scales and at ion scales, uh, the alpha and vortices are dominant more than 80%. Uh, the current sheets are quite rare. They are about 
ten percent at the uh, MHC schemes, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and the magnetic poles are quite rare. But at Sapphire schemes, we obtain the result about that uh, just a little bit, yeah, about about fifty percent of, uh, of structures are iron vortices, uh, with about five percent of current ship like structures and about five percent of magnetic poles. But and what is also interesting is that our method wasn't was not able to identify about 40% of events at uh, Sabine scales. Uh, this is possibly because uh, the models that we are using were originally um, made to describe MHD scale structures, so they are not directly applied at Sabine scales. But the geometrical, yeah, yeah, kind of um, properties of the perturbations at Sabine scales can be similar to. Um, uh, to to the structures at MHG schemes, yeah. So what is um, what is uh, yeah? So when we get this result, we ask ourselves question: Why why only a few current shifts observed in our time interval? And uh, to respond to this question, we analyzed visually one hundred events at MHG scales. We concluded that, in fact, indeed, there is only a small fraction of about 2% of structures uh, that are isolated currently. So inside the time interval of 100 seconds, there is only one current sheet in the center and no other structures anywhere in the interval uh, that we are considering. Um, about 10% of, uh, of these structures are non-isolated current sheets. So there is a current sheet in the center and maybe other structures somewhere nearby. That's why and the presence of these structures nearby, they are affecting the result of the minimum variance analysis and affecting our result of classification. But still the current sheets are about like, yeah, below, below 50%, I would say. Uh, and vortices are deep. Dominant, uh, and but the most dominant um, group of structures are uh, vortices embedded in current sheets, superposed one on top of another, uh, like this. So uh, you can see the magnetic field in the row uh, in the row data in minimum virus reference frame. So the red is the most but intense marine magnetic field component. <coughs> you can see the current sheet in yellow. So the magnetic field is changing sign. But on top of this current sheet, there is a vortex uh, like this. And um, so our classification method is not adopted for the moment to account such events or for such events. So I would like to pass to the conclusions of uh, the presentation. Uh, we investigated turbulent coherent structures uh, at the distance of 0 0.17 astronomical units from the sun. Um, we found that um, we observed the embedding of iron and sub-iron scale structures inside the bigger energy scale structures, but Currently, uh, smaller scale structures are much more numerous, but the feeling factor is a bit below that uh, the feeling factor for MHG scale structures. Uh, we also propose a new automatic method to distinguish between different types of uh, structures. And this method is um, indicating that iron vortices are dominant uh, at MHG and iron scales. Uh, and even at sub ion scales. Although at sub ion scales, um, we need to improve um, our uh, models to, uh, to fit the, the data. And uh, finally, uh, we uh, re derived the model, we refined the model 
uh, of the iPhone vortices with a detailed discussion of the um, uh, assumptions because in the original paper it was uh, the, the intermediate steps they were uh, fully discussed on the stated the solution was like given but we um, repeated this um, derivation with a more systematic in a more systematic way and also we generalized this uh, model to describe also uh, multipole vortices and possibility of different vortices to be superposed in the solution. Yeah, so uh, there are also open questions after, after, uh, after this work. Uh, quite a lot of them, but I, I selected only these three main points. So first, uh, we can improve uh, our automatic classification method to, um, to be able to uh, estimate uh, these propor proportions of different types of coherent structures to, to account for uh, these um, current sheets and vortices superposed. Also, we can do different models of structures. Uh, we can, uh, yeah, and we also can test the results of the of our classification method with the more controlled conditions, uh, for example, with the multiple multiple spacecraft. Um, yeah, the analysis of coherent structures can be expanded to different conditions of the solar wind, um, different types of solar wind, uh, different plasma beta, different velocity of the solar wind. Um, yeah, and uh, the question which is also quite interesting and uh, open, but is is even more difficult to uh, to investigate this is how uh, these structures evolve um, in the solar wind expansion. Uh, this is, this could be possibly done uh, with the two spacecraft alignments when the plasma is first crossing one spacecraft and then crossing another one. So uh, we can evaluate the number and the proportions of different structures. Uh, closer to the sun, and then after some time of the evolution, and then if these proportions are different, uh, then we can probably say something about the stability of these events, of, of, of these the structures. Uh, so I would say that this is very promising, uh, promising project for the future. Yeah, so I would like to, 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 yeah, to stop here. Thank you. So we are going to ask questions, and we will first hear the questions from the referees. So can you begin? Did you? T I don't hear you well. Did you ask me? Yes, we hear you. Um. Okay. So I'll start anyway. Uh, I want to congratulate. Um, the speaker for, for this presentation. It's uh, very clear. I um, also am quite intrigued when you say to me, uh, current sheets are very few and far between. Well, that uh, tickles my curiosity. And I was wondering when you look at page 36, uh, the, the, or maybe not 36, but when you show the Alvan Vortex, yeah. Uh, don't you think that within the Alvan vortex there is a current sheet? Um, in, yeah, in, in, in fact, um, in fact uh, what I call a current sheet here, um, here at MHT scales, the observable fluctuation, which is um, which is more consistent with the model of the uh, model of the uh, Alvan vortex inside. Uh, in the very center of the, indeed, in the, in the very center of the Alphan vortex, there is a concentration of the current. Uh, but it's quite difficult to uh, say. Um, so, in fact, in order 
yeah, in order to, it, it depends on the definition, what we mean by, uh, by a current sheet. If we mean by current sheet concentration of the current density, then yes, there is a, cent there is a current sheet in the center of the vortex. Uh, but if we um, try to understand what is the, the geometry of the structure, what is the possible geometry of the structure in 3D around the, the central time, um, then um, I would say that this event is rather a vortex than it would look like a vortex, even visually, uh, I believe, uh, if we look at the 3D. What is the scale of the vortex, of the Elven vortex? I thought it was a large scale object, but you seem to say that you find it at all scales. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, this is at the scales. This is this is MHC scales. So in kilometers, it is about it is about um, three to the ten to the power of four uh, kilometers. So thirty thousand kilometers, uh, something about that. Um, yeah, but indeed uh, the fluctuations. At uh, iron and sapphire scales, they indeed resemble resemble an embedded vortex uh, somewhere inside uh, the large one. Uh, so the scale of these embedded vortices it is smaller. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> sorry, I, I hope I answered your question. Mm. Yeah, in part um, that. I have another question, which is, um, do you know whether there would be differences in the statistics of structures if you were to go further from the sun? Um, do you know, or can you uh, hypothesize? Yeah, this is, this is a very interesting uh, question. Uh, but for the moment, uh, there are quite uh, only a few number of studies uh, that, um, that is that are evaluating the proportions of different events, such, for example, the article of Pierone, uh, she, she was doing uh, in, in 2016 and 17, she was analyzing coherent structures at the distance of uh, one astronomical unit. And then there is a, there is a new uh, article of uh, Pierone, who is, uh, where she is analyzing different types of coherent structures closer to the sun at iron scales, which is important, at iron scales, only at iron scales. And uh, the conclusion which, is, um, which she is giving is that uh, she found more current shifts closer, uh, closer to the sun, but she is uh, doing a, it in a kind of a visual way. Uh, so she's not proposing the, automatic uh, objective uh, method to evaluate the number of structures, but rather uh, given the numbers after the visual analysis. So, uh, so yeah, answering your questions finally is that uh, there are only a few studies like that uh, where different types of structures are analyzed and um, in these studies, indeed, uh, they found that they found more vortices further from the sun than over to the sun. Okay. Um, and there is one thing um, you did not talk today, or I didn't hear it, which is the switchbacks. But I thought I read it in your manuscript. Can you comment yeah. on switchbacks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Apparently, so apparently, uh, some proportion um, of of our statistics uh, of the coherent structures that we are we have detected, uh, they are either current sheet. Yeah, for example, um, we found uh, a current sheet at the boundary of a switchback. So uh, a current sheet. Um, with the magnetic field, with the radial magnetic field component that is changing sign. Uh, so current sheet at the boundary of a switchback, but also we found uh, 
an event like this. Uh, this is the this is this event in the center. It was detected by our method as a coherent structure. Uh, and if you look at the radiomagnetic field component, uh, everywhere around this structure, the magnetic field is negative. But here in the center, in two regions, it is positive. So it is in fact, uh, it is in fact um, two neighboring switchbacks. And uh, our method is detecting this as a coherent structure. So probably there is a, there is a link between coherent structures and the uh, switchbacks that is worth studying further. Okay. Well, uh, I'll stop here again. Uh, congratulations on your work. It's uh, very interesting to see the classification of structures. Thank you. Thank you. So now, uh, Marco Belli. Uh, hello, Alexander. Um, thank you. Um, your, your thesis was very interesting to read. Um, I have a few questions. Um, one concerns uh, the alpha and vortice, the vortices. It's called them vortices. Um, uh, you incline them to a slight angle to the magnetic field, to the to the B zero in your um, reduced MHD model, and then you find the solutions. One which is a classic Alvin solution, psi equals plus or minus one, and one with arbitrary psi. Now psi. Psi still has to remain of order one, if I'm not mistaken, because u and alpha are both very small quantities, yes? Yes. Uh, I, I, yes, yes. So psi is order one, but you could have both kinetic energy excess and magnetic energy excess in theory yes. Yes. in your system. Yes. So yes. how do you choose between the two? And in particular, the ones that you fit, do you, do you have any idea what these values of psi would be? In our observational study, I, I think this is worth doing with observations, um, because uh, um, yeah. But for the case of the of the magnetic field, yeah. But but you should have to find the corresponding slide. Yeah. In case of in case of this uh, this vortex, we will mm -hmm. find um, the icon. Uh, icon uh, ratio, so the ratio of the magnetic field fluctuations and the, and the velocity uh, fluctuations. And here we found that uh, Xi is indeed very close to <coughs> so this icon vortex, really close to, to the, to, to, yeah, it's nearly absolutely iconic. Um, so the point is that it seems to me, tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, here, 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 here is Xi is equal to. With C equal to plus or minus one, your solutions are exact and only in your solutions, in fact. But if C is different from one, then your linearization at some point should fail because uh, you'll have nonlinear interactions evolving the structures. Um, Am I correct? Um, in, fact, in, in fact, I would say that um, if, psi, if Xi is equal, uh, is equal exactly to one, uh, then we have a indeed alphanic solution. Right, uh, which is an exact nonlinear solution of our MHD. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, let me first find the um, corresponding formula here. Um, yeah. Yeah, so indeed, if if psi is equal to plus or minus two, then this equation is uh, is a uh, is a uh, is it is a uh, how to say it? It is uh, valid, uh, and there is no requirement on on uh, a z. So it means essentially that in case if psi is equal to plus or minus one, then uh, the geometry of the vortex can be arbitrary, have no constraints. Yes. Exactly. Uh, but not only that, it's but it's more than that, Alexander. It seems to me that you can have any dependence on variables x, y, and t essentially, because these are exact nonlinear solutions, the equations. Um, however, if c is not equal to plus or minus one, then you're linear, then you're forced to do the linearization because then otherwise yeah. you have nonlinear terms that are yeah. turned on and they will evolve yeah. with time. I, yeah, I agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
right? So, so the other question, of course, has to do with switchbacks again, and and more generally the applicability of reduced MHD. You know, in reduced MHD, there are no fluctuations parallel to the mean field. So, in the solar wind, we have a couple of very big effects. Well, first of all, we see these very strong oscillations in the radial component of the field, which clearly cannot be described in reduced MHD. Um, and secondly, there's the overall solar wind expansion. So do you have any comments on what you think uh, would be required to kind of extend your analysis beyond reduced MHD? Uh, yeah, I agree, in fact, about your critics of uh, the reduced MHD, because uh, in fact, um, it is a quite a strong uh, simplification. And for example, our vortex is not really, as we observed uh, here, um, the amplitude of the vortex is very strong, uh, and the amplitude is of the order of the mean field. And uh, in this case, reduced MHD cannot be really directly directly applied. Um, yeah, but this is a very interesting question that works study throws us how to um, how to proceed. Um, how, how to overcome this uh, simplification to get still some 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 results mm, yeah all right well then thanks i just want to um i found all the uh, chapters also on the uh, isolation of the different types of structures very interesting thank you thank you so um, yeah, hello. Uh, so thanks again for your clear presentation. Uh, it was uh, interesting to see uh, the uh, evidence of these uh, structures. Um, as a Nick, I have uh, some puzzling uh, issue with the number of uh, uh, current sheets uh, uh, that have been observed. So uh, of course, you already uh, mentioned that uh, it would be useful to go to uh, different regions of the solar wind to test that, maybe to uh, simulations to actually uh, test a, a little bit the, the technique that you have been uh, using uh, so far. Um, but I have a more basic question. I mean, have you tried to change the threshold in the, the definition of coherent structure? Because it seems that you have many, many coherent structures, and that uh, may be too many. And so if you decrease the number of structures, the ratio between the observed structures, uh, vortices, and current sheets would be completely different. So um, it seems to me that uh, if you take a current sheet and you take a, a small fluctuation about it, um, you say, well, the fluctuation uh, is observed as uh, an embedded vortex, but uh, it could just be just uh, a small random fluctuation. So how can you test that? Uh, you know, trying to to do a uh, a test on um, superposing random noise on your uh, a different frequency on your systems and and check if you would detect a, a, a fake vortex in the center of the current sheet, or if it's ready. Uh, the vortex embedded in the current sheet, which to me seems uh, that a bit unlike, I mean, the probability to encounter the formation of a plasmoid inside a vortex sheet uh, with uh, one single satellite crossing the data seems to be quite low. And so, but you have many of them. So, um, so again, the question is, have you tried to change the threshold uh, to uh, measure, to define uh, coherent structures. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting proposition to test further our classification method because indeed uh, maybe there is a dependence if we take only the fraction of the most uh, intense events and uh, apply our method on, on these statistics or if we compare these results with the general statistics, maybe there would be some difference. Uh, but we have not done this for the moment. Uh, we what we did is that we did increase the threshold um, in order to reduce the number of structures for visual classification. This we did. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but um, yeah, I agree that this would be interesting to uh, to verify and to improve the classification method for them. Thank you. Yeah, and um, again on the papers by Peron, but the, the one on 2020, uh, which is uh, also close to the sun, the conclusions are also completely different, but the techniques is different. And, uh, but also she mentions that uh, there are other types of uh, identified structures, these are uh, wave packets. Uh, so you don't mention wave packets. Uh, have you seen any, or is it just that uh, the uh, sample of the solar wind is uh, very different in your case? Uh, in fact, we really did not uh, found a lot of uh, long uh, wave packets uh, maintaining the same phase uh, for the long period of time. We have not observed this in Scalagram, so, uh, and it was a bit out of our topic of research. So I would rather say that in this interval, um, so I would say that this is why we, we consider mainly uh, the coherent structures, but not wave packets. We have not found them in the Scalagram, so um, yeah, that's why. So what, what, to, to your opinion, what is the difference, the main difference between Perron's 2020 work and yours? Uh, the first the first is that Perron, was, she was analyzing the coherent structures only at ion scales. Uh, in my case, it is, uh, we are analyzing MHT ion and sub-ion scales. We show more than, uh, besides that, we are uh, we are showing the embedding of smaller scale structures into larger ones. Verona uh, was not studying that. Um, and uh, also the difference is that Verona is using uh, the visual classification of coherent structures, which may introduce a kind of a bias uh, to the, uh, in, favor, in favor of current shifts, because current shifts are really quite easy to, to catch visually, in contra uh, yeah, easy to identify. Uh, in contrast, iPhone vortices, they are uh, more complex, and uh, especially if you cross it not through the center, but uh, uh, at some distance from the center, then there are two components that are changing and uh, it's difficult to, yeah. So I would say that, yeah, this is, this is my response. Mm. But, but uh, you know, more precisely, uh, you mentioned that you find more uh, vortices, but uh, one, one of the characteristics of uh, the coherent structures that you mentioned at the beginning of your thesis is that they must be coherent on time. So, of course, here you cannot verify that in your sample. It's uh, almost impossible. But it, so it probably means that many of the identified uh, vortex vortices that you have uh, might not be actual coherent structures. They might just disappear just a minute after that. You don't, you don't actually know. It's in, almost impossible to know. But uh, do you agree that there is a, a clear overestimation of uh, vortices due to the fact that you cannot be sure that these structures are really coherent in time? Uh, so uh, I in fact, So um, if I understood the question well, uh, am I sure that um, the vortices are indeed coherent structures? But um, yeah, the answer would be yes. Why? Because we indeed observe uh, the coupled phases around, um, along different scales. So we indeed observe these vertical lines with the signature of the coherent structures. And that's how we detect these structures. So, um, yeah, so my answer would be yes, I, I, I think this is a coherent structure, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, may, we may, yeah, I would say probably we need to indeed improve and check uh, the, the classification method uh, in order to. Um, to converge from one hand side from the visual uh, 
uh, or from visual classification and from another hand side from the automatic method uh, to converge to a more or less the same understanding. Yeah. Uh, I agree that there is a kind of um, um, kind of uh, difference uh, between these two approaches with, with, this, with these two results. Especially, I have a further comment on the subion uh, vortices because, I mean, the correct model in this case should be the one of Jovanovic. Uh, so I don't know how difficult it would be to actually make a, a fit with this kind of model, which is much more complex than the one of Pokotirov. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, the difference is uh, significant because there is a, a, a large uh, compressible component in it, but still, Using pocket of uh, fitting, you observed a lot of, of these fluctuations. So uh, maybe by taking the correct Jovanovich profile, the, you would decrease by a lot the number of vortices that you can identify. No? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is this is the project to do further. Yeah. Yeah. Another comment on on, on the on the mirror modes. Uh, you, you, I mean, you you mentioned. Uh, uh, interesting uh, things. I mean, first of all, at, at, at MHD scale, you, you mentioned uh, mirror holes, I mean, your magnetic holes, uh, and you associate them with mirrors. But actually, it's a bit quite, uh, it's, I, I think, to, to these dates, there is no uh, clear uh, mechanism to actually form magnetic hole at l large scales because uh, if you take a mirror instability uh, in an idealized environment, it will create the mirror hams and not mirror holes. So uh, the transformation of hams into stable magnetic holes is still an open issue. But uh, what you mentioned is that at small scales, you find magnetic, uh, magnetic holes, which seem to be correlated with uh, electron pressure increase, uh, in which case uh, the underlying uh, instability might not be the mirror instability, but uh, the one by uh, uh, the so-called um, uh, the instability of, uh, of Bruno Coppi and uh, uh, I forgot the other authors, <laughs> uh, which is uh, a different in nature and uh, which uh, uh, still could connect to the mirror instability if you add both the ion and the electron temperature anisotropy. Have you looked at uh, the details of uh, of this uh, mirror structure of this uh, magnetic hole structure at small scale? Do you have any uh, uh, blow up of what happens? And because they are quite interesting, these uh, these structures. Uh, yeah, I agree that uh, this is very interesting and hot topic. But the problem is that time resolution. Is not enough to analyze the plasma data at subion scales. We have only magnetic field, and uh, this is the main limitation for us to uh, to say something about subion scale coherent structures. We can base only on the magnetic population, and that's it. Mm. Uh, but there are some indeed some simulation works and theoretical works uh, about the subion scale magnetic holes. Such as uh, Heinz and uh, Reutenstern, that they found the formation of magnetic holes in simulations uh, and uh, also identified the, the, the geometry of these structures. Uh, yeah, so this is, a, this is an interesting topic, but without observational data, we cannot advance much further. Okay, yeah, but you know, I mean, the instability, uh, the, the field swelling instability has not been very greatly studied in in, in its nonlinear stage, and uh, that would be quite interesting to have uh, to identify this kind of structures and compare with simulations. That uh, uh, interesting thing. So uh, I I also have some more 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 detailed question like the the. the in the in the in the figure four point three, when when you uh, have these vortices uh, embedded in the current sheets, uh, just one quick question: the the the, the frames of uh, the reference frame for the magnetic field, is it the same from MHD to ion and subion scales, or do you change the the? No. Ah, okay. No. no, no, it is different. So I mean. Uh, I apply uh, minimum variance uh, analysis at MHD scales and then independently at ion scales. 
yeah, so, so you cannot superpose. So you cannot superpose the yeah okay. So they are different different reference frames. Yeah. yeah. And um, okay, so basically uh, all the other comments are really minor. So I thank you again for your for your answering the questions and uh, okay. Thank you. So uh, I uh, I'm the outsider here. I come from the, the, the field of uh, ISM turbulence, and so it was a bit difficult at some point to to read your manuscript. I think some definitions might uh, might be included for the yeah. the outsider reader. But nevertheless, I found this is a very exciting PhD thesis. I really enjoyed re reading it. And I have, as a result, a lot of questions. <laughs> you <laughs> will have to stop, stop me, probably. Uh, but it's uh, fascinating to see that uh, you actually have access to real data on which you can work and actually play with, uh, with uh, MHD models. So that's uh, really something we don't have in my field. Um, so as an introduction, you, you never uh, discussed the magnitude of the magnetic field. And you say that it's, uh, the, the solar wind is incompressible, but what's the, the status of this? So what's the magnitude of the field compared to the velocity? Yeah, uh, so um, you mean at the distance of, the distance of 0 0.17 feet, for instance? Yeah, so the magnitude of magnetic field is about 100 nanotesla. Um, yeah, you mean you want to study the, uh, your question is about the compressibility. Okay. The compressibility is about uh, two percent or something like that, from two to five percent. So yeah, mainly, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Mach number, I, I I cannot give it right now. Sorry. Um, so I was really impressed by the the Alvin Vortex model. I I liked a lot the mathematics of it, and then I I had to look to the Previous papers uh, led to this model, and uh, there's uh, a paper, a very early paper on uh, uh, solitary Rossby waves, uh, so hydrodynamics on the on the atmosphere of the Earth. And uh, on one of these models, instead, so you decided to choose to put the current exactly zero outside the radius yeah, of the vortex. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they don't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure you, uh, so they, they use, uh, instead of having the minus k squared, they have a plus p squared. So ah, they just yeah. change, so change kind the of sign. Decay. Exactly, they have an exponential decay. And I was wondering whether you looked at this and whether this would change the, the boundary condition, because maybe the fact that you get only zeros of Bessel functions might be from the stringent yeah, 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 yeah. boundary I, conditions at the center. I agree that may that, that may change the boundary conditions. Yeah, because the, the solution outside would be different then, and thus correspondingly the linking of the linking of the coefficients inside and outside for each harmonics would be a bit different. Yeah, we need to, to consider that also. Maybe we will get more freedom uh, and not fixing the amplitude of the dipole vortex, for example, uh, because yeah, if you have more freedom outside, then probably this term i for x, uh, which is coupled with the dipole vortex, defining its amplitude, probably we won't have a, such a strict constraint. Yeah, so we need to do this. Yeah. My next question on this was whether you could investigate this boundary condition in the data. So you mentioned this xi uh, ratio, but you also have the k times a. Is there any way you can see that in the data, measure it, and check whether it's uh, actually uh, yeah, xi, close to zeros of the Bessel function? Xi, we, we can directly measure it because this is related to the trump of, yeah, to the amplitude of the magnetic and velocity fluctuations, so we can measure it directly. Have you tried it? Uh, yeah, we did it for, for several examples. Uh, this is provided in the article. Um, I think in the basis, in the supplementary, probably it is also provided in the appendix um, where we analyze in detail uh, each event. Uh, 
we, we also provide the albinicity ratio, so it gives us the C. Uh, yeah. But this would be also probably interesting to uh, add this uh, in the statistical analysis. For, for example, if we select only the alpha and vortices in our statistics, uh, according to our method, then probably among these structures, we can estimate uh, what is the characteristic C, is it below one or above one? This can be done, yeah. But we have not yet for the moment. Okay, next I move to the observations. Uh, or maybe I think this, uh, although I have one further question on the vortices, because uh, the end of this first paper uh, of Larry Chef and Maurice Depp on the, the OSB isolated waves, they say, uh, so this is a solution to the steady state solution, but to, uh, to know whether this exists uh, really, we have to do the linear, uh, the time dependent stability analysis. Maybe all these structures, they would be destroyed very quickly. Yeah, yeah. You thought about this? Yeah, this is another uh, interesting question. But this have not been done before for Alpine vortices, and we have not approached this. But it's been done for current sheets. This has been done for current sheets. OK, so moving to the observations, uh, this technique of using the wavelets, which are uh, still uh, here, uh, compared to the increments, yeah. uh, the increments are uh, doing a plus side and a minus side. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the corresponding wavelet to, to the increment is actually a uh, non-symmetrical uh, one. Yeah. Okay, a bump, positive bump. Plus yeah, negative. yeah, yeah. Car, car wavelet. Exactly. I think the ones you are using now are symmetric. Yeah. Can this be the origin of why you will be more sensitive to uh, albin vortices than to current sheets, whereas yeah. increments would be more yeah. sensitive to current sheets. We, start, we started uh, comparing um, comparing the peaks of the local intermittency measure for different mother functions. And indeed, there is a quite significant difference if we take, uh, if we take uh, even if we, if we take, for example, Morley and, uh, and Carr, which is similar to PVI, uh, Indeed, there is a difference. Uh, so, uh, but Morley, why we selected Morley? Because it has both uh, good resolution in, in, in periods and in time. So it was kind of a compromise. Uh, we also wanted to observe on the scalogram if there are uh, horizontal uh, bands that are waves, and we did not found uh, many. So. That's why Morley was, was a kind of compromise solution. But indeed, depending on the mother function that we are choosing, uh, probably the proportions of structures would be different. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you see you've about this. Uh, I, I'm a bit worried as well by the fitting procedure, which is not exactly a fitting procedure. What you're doing is to try to match the, the variance ratios by the several uh, models, yeah. which, you, which you could, for instance, if you were looking at only shocks, but you have no model of shocks, you're, you're trying to fit these with uh, albin vortices and, uh, and uh, current sheets, maybe uh, the shocks would be able as well to give you a spread in the lambda two over lambda three and lambda one over lambda two, okay, in that space. And then you would find uh, a given distribution for these shocks, but which, uh, for the uh, vortices uh, and stuff. I, I see your point. You see my point. It's a bit yeah. too indirect, I think, to, yeah. to claim that it's pretty. I agree to some degree, uh, but why we thought that this is a kind of a good method because in fact, uh, these minimum variance results, they reflect, uh, for example, if we take one trajectory, some, some project, if we take a trajectory, uh, then these minimum variance results, um, they reflect if you have uh, only a single magnetic field component, which is uh, very distinguished compared to two others, like in case of the current sheet, where we have principal component that is changing sign. Two others are nearly constant, but 
Okay, it depends on the model of the current ship, but still, you have principal component that is most liberal, and all the two others, all the two, two, two others are much less uh, with much less distinguished. In case of the vortex, um, if you cross it not along the not directly along the center, which is low probability, but if you cross it somewhere in the mid, yeah, at some distance from the center, you will get two components of magnetic field. Uh, that are strongly varying. And uh, the actual component would be nearly constant because, because in the model of the vortex, you have only perpendicular fluctuations. So this is why for the vortex, for the current ship like structures, uh, we expect to have different statistical results. So it's not, it's not um, just, so, there is a um, kind of justification of this method, but I agree about some degree of your criticism. To some degree, I agree with your criticism. Um, it is quite indirect. And also uh, the fact that we are using the filtration, is, it's also introducing some ambiguities and also the fact that in order to compare the observations, with the models, uh, we need to uh, add some level of noise, noisy fluctuation in the models. Um, uh, and this level of noise <coughs> estimated from observations, the, the level of noise compared to the amplitude of the structure. We estimate it from, uh, from the observations and then add this noise into the models. And depending on the amplitude of the on the relative amplitude of the noise, this minimum virus results would be different. So it is another um, uh, point uh, that is um, giving us some, probably giving us some uncertainty. The noise, <laughs> first of the noise, and then uh, the fact that we need to include it. Uh, and uh, account for it, uh, account for its effect on the parts of the Maybe you could try to design a mock experiment, mock data, by putting in many current sheets and not that many vortices at random uh, yeah. uh, places, and try your method on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try yeah, whether yeah. You, you recover indeed. Uh, it would it would be reassuring. Yeah, for, yeah, 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 yeah. This. Yeah, this we need to do this. Yeah, in, in 3D. Uh, so maybe. Ah, yes. Uh, I wasn't sure. So, still on this method, uh, the probabilistic method, uh, is, and uh, this is my, I'm showing my ignorance on the satellite, but is the position of the satellite, the crossing, completely random with respect to the orientation of the expected orientation of the structures? Uh, or do we expect to have uh, some kind of orientation with respect to the mean radial field? Or? Yeah, in fact, we know about the groupness that is anisotropic with respect to the magnetic field, the same way as the, um, the same way as the Eiffel vortex. So Eiffel vortex is nearly aligned with the magnetic field. So knowing the knowing the velocity of the solar wind, which is much above the velocity of the spacecraft, then we know nearly uh, how we cross the vortex, which direction, uh, and the orientation of the magnetic field gives us the estimation of the axis of the vortex. So yeah, I would say that we can say something if we if we once we are sure that this is a nitrogen vortex. We can kind of reconstruct the, how it is oriented. <laughs> it's that's, 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 that's still the embedding of the, of the structure. Uh, when you look at this picture, uh, you've tried to, this is mock data, but when you look at the actual data, it's a very vertical line. So, is it uh, have you tried to investigate systematically uh, what kind of structures are embedded in other in others? Or? 
Can you make a tree of structures? A tree of structures, the same as the uh, Greco probably did for current sheets. I mean, uh, if there is a one large tree of structure and there are multiple mm -hmm. embedded, um, yeah, this would be interesting, but we, we limited ourselves to the scanogram. Okay, thanks for your answers, which show that you master your subject. And congratulations again. Thank you. Okay, we will now listen to invited members uh, of the Atelier. Yep, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Sasha. An interesting presentation. Let me ask a little bit more about the technical things are related to the MVA technique. If I understand correctly, that's the main technique you apply to determine them. Let's put this way, dimensionality of your structures, like two-dimensional versus one, uh, depending on the eigenvalues. Uh, uh, it's like, of course, it's not the ideal type of technique. There are many problems with this analysis of single spacecraft data set. So could you uh, specify, uh, did you compare the criteria of... Um, let's say, of reliability of this technique uh, with the previous results from multi-spacecraft missions, because if I know correctly, uh, MVA have been tested with the multi-spacecraft mission as well, and there is certain threshold for the eigenvalues for MVA when we can trust to MVA and we can not trust to MVA, and this threshold have been determined from, I mean, comparing of this MVA with the cluster data sets when people use the multi-spacecraft data to determine the orientation of magnetic structure. So did you try to evaluate this type of things, like trying to find the threshold for your eigenvalues ratios when you can trust to MVA data set and when you already cannot trust to them? Uh, in fact, uh, and on, uh, our um, application of the minimum variance method, it is not mainly about the orientation of the Asian vectors. It is uh, mostly based on the Asian values that we have. So um, the most important that um, the most important thing that we are basing on our analysis is rather uh, the ratios of Asian Asian values than the or than the uh, direct orientation of um, uh, of the Asian vectors. Uh, indeed, in order to be sure that uh, minimum uh, that the vectors are unambiguously uh, unambiguously defined. You need a sort. Yeah, you need to have a. Uh, you need to have a. Have a the neighboring. Uh, the na yeah, the ratio of the uh, the ratio of the Asian values uh, below something like zero point three uh, to be sure uh, that both of these directions are really indeed. Uh, oriented like this, uh, but in our uh, research, we were um, this was this was not the main um, uh, this was not the main result that we were using in the evaluation of different types of structures. Um, so yeah, um, and when we were uh, showing the yeah this this is about this is about the classification method. If we come back to the study of um, of examples uh, in the thesis, then uh, for each um, for each event, we were indeed highlighting the uh, uh, we were highlighting um, if uh, all the three directions of the minimum variance uh, reference frame are well defined with using the criteria that I that I have just mentioned that is uh, used in the literature, that uh, the ratio of the Asian values is uh, uh, below 0 0.3. So for the examples of events, when it was important to be sure that, um, be sure about the direction uh, of the reference frame system, we, were, we, was, we was providing this um, in, in the figure and in the discussion in the appendix. Uh, I, I, I hope um, I answered your question. Okay, more or less. Uh, what's about, let's put this way, um, 
this your idea of uh, combining the uh, actual data sets by results of I mean, like linear combination of data set provided by different type of structures. Uh, I probably miss this moment. Uh, is a type of technique provide you something like unique uh, solution? So it's always the same type of combination. Oh, it's like depends on some additional assumptions. Exactly this one, yeah. The data versus models. Like, is it sort of uh, well, for each data set you have only one possible possible combination, or it's you have yeah. have certain level of uncertainties and you can uh, use some additional criteria to determine what the ratio between the different contrib different structure contribution finally yeah. result in your data set. Uh, for this for this uh, problem, the solution is unique. Uh, provided that we are using the given norm, uh, the norm that we are minimizing. Uh, here we are minimizing the sum of the, uh, the sum of the squares of the differences for each bin, for each bin. So uh, if the norm that we are minimizing is uh, given, then we get a unique solution of this problem. Uh, we also verified what we, yeah, what we would get if instead of the square norm, we would use a absolute a absolute difference norm. And uh, yeah, we, we got a little bit different numbers, but uh, but um, the conclusion is nearly the same that item vortices are still dominant, and this is not dependent on whether you take square norm or or linear absolute. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, then maybe the last question from my side. Uh, this type of uh, data set you show here for rotational and tangential discontinuity, uh, current sheets, for example, current sheets, as well as first for vortex, they should some, somehow depend on the uh, parameters of the structures in sense like I mean if it's rotational discontinuity what's the rate what's the angle of rotation of magnetic field if it's tangential discontinuity like what's the jumps of the magnetic field magnitude across the discontinuity so like it's not it should not be so, so, sort of unique type of um, picture for all possible discontinuity configurations and all possible vortex configurations so you should somehow restrict your uh, range of parameters before plotting this figure so how did you let's say, determine this parameter range, or did you somehow deduce it from the previous observations? Like, because there is a very wide range of rotational discontinuities properties, so, and you have to define uh, what type of parametrical range of these properties you will use for, for fitting the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is true, uh, and uh, for, in case, in case of, especially in case of the rotational discontinuities, because um, the minimum variance results indeed depend on the uh, rotation angle of the magnetic field uh, uh, acro across the current sheet. Uh, for MH, yeah, for MHD scales, we took the same rotation angle as uh, uh, as we observed in some examples that we analyzed before, uh, in just in case, case by case in the case by case study. Uh, but um, yeah, but the limiting case um, of yeah, uh, I would say that um, I would say that if you take a smaller yeah, we took quite a large rotation angle for MHT scales about ninety degrees if I remember well, uh, but if you take a smaller rotation angle degrees, then uh, the shear component is fluctuating even less, and then uh, the minimum variance results, they are something in between the results for rotational discontinuities and the tangential discontinuities. So, uh, the con yeah, um, for, and um, so this is, this is um, another point, yeah. And, but for, for, for the monopoly and dipole vortices, uh, there is, I would say that, uh, there is no uh, parameter like this that would uh, change uh, so much the, the, the statistics, the results of the minimum variance uh, 
applied to, to the set of trajectories. Except for the dipole vortex, it is quite important um, uh, that, um, the orientation of the, the the orientation of the vortex with respect to the crossing trajectory is quite important because uh, you can yeah you have a dipole yeah so if, if the vortex is inclined a little bit and um, if you cross it uh, in the perpendicular plane in and or if you cross it in the parallel uh, in, in the direction of inclination then you would observe uh, a bit different results, and this we we took into we took this into account by um, having both crossings like uh, like this and uh, from the side. Um, so yeah, I hope. Yeah. Is, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I clear? think it's like yeah. I think it's more or less fine. In a sense, like I mean, I, I I sort of understand the idea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, join my my colleagues to uh, congratulate you for your work and your presentation. You. And then uh, I would like first uh, to make, in fact, your PhD in uh, perspective because it was not starting like uh, you were presenting. In fact, uh, it was a co uh, between the Paris Observatory and the University of Moscow. And then, but okay, there were uh, quite uh, significant events which happened. Uh, first, the COVID, then the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And then uh, it was a very uh, stressful uh, period. I mean, I feel it as a French, but uh, being Russian and uh, being far from family and for friends uh, there and uh, Oh, with all the problem which is implied. I mean, it was certainly very stressful for, for you. And I was clearly seeing this in your behavior. But okay, many would have uh, just, uh, would have not be able to continue the, the PhD, but still you, you were finding the, the, the strengths of the months of uh, wonders. And then finally you, you succeed. And then also, I mean, your PhD uh, was completely changed because, I mean, the co turn was completely over. Yeah. And then at uh, that time we were discussing, I was discussing with Onga, and Onga uh, bring me in the, the subject. For me, it was something which was uh, quite new. I was not really uh, in this uh, small scale structure. I was coming more from the large, very large scale that you have not shown. It, uh, it's associated to what, uh, is ejected from the sun, the ICME. So, I mean, that's really big stuff. And there is flux shop in particular in the magnetic cloud. So there is some analogy sometime with this uh, structure, this with uh, vent vortex and many things which are different. So I was wondering, I had many questions at that time, so I will not ask them. And I was, uh, I really appreciate uh, the, the way you were uh, interacting uh, with me. I mean, uh, explaining me different things, pointing to the literature, but also, uh, uh, frankly, uh, saying uh, about your, your thoughts that you were having. So, uh, okay, I thank you for, for this. And of course, there is uh, many, many uh, questions uh, uh, yet which remains. So uh, I hope that with all the knowledge that you have developed, you will uh, succeed to continue. And I hope for you that it will be in, uh, in a quieter and more, uh, uh, I mean, something more relaxed and more propice to do a research. Thank you, Pascal. Yeah. <coughs> um, yeah, I, I would like just to mention that the results of this PhD are really very interesting because uh, uh, before the PhD days of Sasha, the half of the community was thinking that solar wind turbulence is a mixture of waves uh, at large scales, iron waves, at uh, kinetic scales, kinetic iron waves, or Whistler waves, so the debate about waves. Then another half of the community was thinking about strong turbulence, intermittency, and current shifts. Uh, only few studies of vortices, so not clear how important they are. And then um, 
And then this, this result shows that the vortices are dominating. I understand the questions of Thierry and Anik and Marco. It's, it's very, very interesting what you say, and Anton. Um, Pierre, thank you very much for your questions because it, um, uh, for example, the, the argument of Thierry is saying that maybe in time they are not stable, so it's just overestimated. But the fact that all phases are just coupled, we, I think is just an indication of a certain stability because if it was not the case, we had this dispersion, different frequencies propagates with different speeds, and then it was destroyed. But the fact that all these vertical lines are there all the time, if you take any time interval the solar wind, we still have these vertical lines. So I think these structures are really very stable and it's not just an overestimation because of the method, but we see them when we go by eyes uh, through the data. <coughs> so it's really new and important also this fact, okay, the dominance of vortices and this multi-scale nature from MRD through ion to sub-ion scales. And it's amazing that nothing changed at ion scales. The number of structures increases with the same power law from MRD to ion to sub-ion scales without any change at ion scales. So it seems that even if the physics change, the number of structures increasing uh, without any changes. Yeah, so the results are very interesting. I hope the paper will be published. <laughs> <laughs> that the larger community than only here in this audience we know about it. Yeah, so great results. Thank you. I'm going to ask one question. <laughs> uh, uh, can you summarize your automatic detection method? Yeah. Uh, I don't understand what is automatic. Yeah. Automatic it means that um, the, it means that uh, in fact I collected a number of statistics of events and I'm not analyzing one by one saying myself this is a this is a vortex this is a current sheet this is a magnetic hole so, but I'm using I'm using the with the minimum variance analysis uh, as a um, as a kind of a signature distinguishing between yes, the different it, maps. You calculate it automatically uh, all the time? Yeah, 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 for each structure, I perform minimum variance analysis, which yes, is automatic. How do you know there is a structure? Uh, I detect the structures before using, uh, using the wavelength uh, local intermittency measure. So first I detect the structure, the statistics of structures with uh, wavelengths. I obtain the statistics, the central times, uh, for the central time so for each event, and then around the given time interval around the central event, I apply the new variance analysis and obtain uh, these uh, the new variance here values. Um, with that, uh, then I am using these results, statistical results, to evaluate if there are more current sheets or alpha vortices in the in, your, in the scalogram, you, you detect automatically the, the lines. Yeah, yeah. I just I just summarize uh, summarize the local intermittency measure in the desired uh, range of scales. For example, if I want to detect a vision scale event, I take a local intermittency measure at the MHD range and do I summarize it again, and then I'm using a threshold. I'm using threshold to detect uh, the central time uh, for the yeah. So it is automatic. Okay, so we are, we are going to stop here. Je vais, je vais vous demander de sortir pour qu'on puisse délibérer.